Welcome to the fifth annual Pline Center Research Lecture. My name is Shelley Gray, and I am Professor and Director of the Pline Center for Geriatric Pharmacy Research, Education, and Outreach at the University of Washington School of Pharmacy. I'm especially excited um, because this year um, we are partnering with the Deternier Center for Healthy Aging in the University of Washington School of Nursing, um, who is co-sponsoring this event. Before we begin the lecture, I'd like to say a few words about the Pline Center. This center was established in 2016 with the transformative gift um, made by Dr. Joy Pline, who passed away in February 2021. She was a pioneer in developing geriatric pharmacy practice and education in the United States. Her passion for her work and her students greatly inspired generations of faculty, staff, and pharmacists. We are grateful for her generous support at the Pline Center and her tireless work to champion the UW School of Pharmacy. Our mission now is to be careful stewards of her support of the center and to build on her legacy. Joy has enriched so many of our lives in countless ways and we miss her every day. Over the past six years, we have launched initiatives in each of our three pillars, research, education, and outreach. The Pine Center researchers collaborate with scientists within the UW Health Sciences and with scientists across the country and world. Our research spans the translational science spectrum and places older adults and their caregivers at the center. For education, we ensure that all PharmD students have the knowledge and skills necessary to care for older adults with multiple health conditions. We have three training programs the Pline Certificate in Geriatric Pharmacy, the Pline Research Scholars who conduct scholarly work related to geriatrics, and we also have a postdoctoral research fellowship program. The Pline Certificate in Geriatric Pharmacy strives to train pharmacists to meet the needs of older adults in all practice centers, and we have graduated um, over 450 certificate um, students over the years. For our outreach efforts, we partner with Era Living Communities, where we work to develop innovative ways for pharmacists and pharmacy students to optimize older adults' medication use and promote healthy aging. It takes a village to plan an event of this nature, and we are thankful for the support of Claire Forster and William Langevin and the donors who, who support the Pine Center. Now moving on to today's main event our keynote lecture. This will last approximately 45 minutes, followed by 30 minutes of Q&A and discussion. We encourage you to add your questions for our speaker to the Zoom Q&A feature. Our moderators will be referring to the chat and your questions as they guide the discussion after the lecture. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Zach Markham, Assistant Director of um, the Pine Center Research, and he will introduce our keynote speaker. Zach, take it away. Thank you, Shelley. So I'm very pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Emily Largent, who is the Emanuel and Robert Hart Assistant Professor of Medical Ethics and Health Policy at the University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Medicine. And she holds a secondary appointment at Penn Law. She's core faculty in the Penn Program on Precision Medicine for the Brain and co-leader of the Penn Alzheimer's Disease Research Center's Outreach Recruitment and Engagement Corps. Dr. Largent's work explores ethical and regulatory aspects of human subjects research, as well as ethical, legal, and social considerations when translating research findings into care, with a particular focus on Alzheimer's disease, which is the focus of our event today. Her research is supported by the National Institute on Aging and the Greenwall Foundation. Thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Largent. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's really my pleasure to be here. So I'm delighted today to be talking about a topic that has I've spent a considerable amount of time thinking about in the last few years, um, which is Alzheimer's disease, aducanumab, and the anxiety surrounding a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease for patients and families, and I would say the anxiety surrounding aducanumab for clinicians. So I do have grant funding from the NIA and from the Greenwall Foundation, but of course the views that I'm presenting here today are entirely my own. 
Now, just to make sure that we're all working from a set playing field, I want to say that dementia is not a specific disease, but it's a label for the loss of cognitive functioning. So thinking, remembering, reasoning, and also of behavioral abilities to an extent that interferes with daily life. Now, Alzheimer's or, um, dementia can have many causes depending on the underlying pathology. And Alzheimer's disease happens to be the most common cause of dementia, accounting for about um, two thirds of the cases of dementia that we see. Now, um, it will not surprise many people, I think, to know that Alzheimer's disease is highly stigmatized and it's also greatly feared, which means that we have a huge public health problem that many people have um, very emotional reactions to. Now, another important piece of background information as I move forward with my talk today is that the field of Alzheimer's disease research and care is currently moving away from a syndromal definition of Alzheimer's disease to a biological definition. So over years, it's been the case that a patient would come to say their general practitioner or to a memory center presenting with a characteristic onset of symptoms and Based on all of that assessment that the clinician would do, they would decide the most likely cause of the patient's symptoms was Alzheimer's disease. And typically that would be probable Alzheimer's disease until it could be confirmed post-mortem, say with an autopsy. Now, there is an evolving understanding in the field that we can actually now use biomarkers, short for biological markers, to identify Alzheimer's disease pathology in vivo. So the three biomarkers we talk about most in the space of Alzheimer's disease are amyloid, tau, and neurodegeneration. This is sometimes called the ATN framework and is parenthetical because it's non-specific to Alzheimer's disease and so slightly less important, I would say, than the other two. And I will highlight amyloid here because that will become a very important theme throughout our discussions today. The other thing I'll mention is that we can measure biomarkers in various ways. Currently, the ones that we use most are PET scans, CSF, so spinal taps and sampling the cerebral spinal fluid, and also MRI. Now, in 2011, President Obama signed the National Alzheimer's Project Act, or NAPA, and what that did is it was trying to reimagine or re-envision care for persons living with Alzheimer's disease and their caregivers, and it resulted in the creation of the National Alzheimer's Plan. The first one of those was in 2012. Um, right here, I have posted the 2021 update, and the plan, the first plan had five goals. The first of these was incredibly ambitious. That's why I have the moon here. It was really a moon shot. The goal is to prevent and effectively treat Alzheimer's disease and related dementias by 2025. So in June 2021, uh, we have the approval of Agihelm. Um, that's the trade name. It also goes by Agicanumab. And what we ended up seeing is that instead of having a celebration around what we would think would be a tremendous milestone, right? We are now four years ahead of schedule. We have a drug that claims to be a disease modifying therapy for Alzheimer's disease, but we don't see the celebration. Instead, what we see are headlines like this one from Paula Spann's New Old Age column in the New York Times saying that the drug offers more questions than answers. And Right. What I'll highlight here is the subtitle that many doctors wondered if it was warranted. So what we started to see was robust discussion within the field about whether or not this was really the thing that we had been hoping for. So my goal for today is to review the timeline of FDA approval for aducanumab, that is how did we get to that article, that headline in the New York Times where we have a tension between hope and confusion. I'll talk a bit about the role of desperation in FDA's decision-making, which I think we have to figure out how to handle that going forward. And I will also identify some challenges that lie ahead. So here's a timeline of the approval of aducanumab. I start somewhat arbitrarily in 2015. Of course, it was a much longer odyssey than this, but 2015 is when Biogen enrolled the first patients in the phase three engage and emerge trials of Aducanumab. 2015 is also the year that Biogen came out with promising data from a phase 1b trial of aducanumab where they found that there was um, some risk associated with brain bleeding and swelling, but that there had also been a statistically significant decrease in amyloid beta plaques in individuals who were on the active treatment versus the placebo. So, um, right, so we see here this is an anti amyloid therapy. A lot happens in 2015. But I'm going to zoom in for purposes of our discussion today and actually start our timeline in 2019. And in 2019, the year kicks off. 
um, with Biogen announcing that it has discontinued the Engage and Emerge trials. Okay. So this announcement comes, they have conducted an interim analysis of the data in December, 2018. And what they did concluding that based on patients who had been enrolled in the trial up to 18 months at that point in time, which was about half the people enrolled in the study, that there was a determination of futility that the study was unlikely to meet the primary outcome, which was a slowing of cognitive and functional impairment as measured by the clinical dementia rating scale sum of boxes or the CDRSB score. So it's important to just underscore this. We're going to see this again. I'm trying to do some heavy foreshadowing for folks that they did not meet their clinical endpoint, the endpoint that we think matters to patients with Alzheimer's disease, which is slowing cognitive and functional impairment. A month later, they would announce that they were not going forward with another phase three study looking at a secondary prevention trial with aducanumab. And I think many people at this point, myself included, really felt that we had reached the end of another chapter where we'd had a promising drug for Alzheimer's disease, and we found that it really hadn't panned out in clinical trials. But if that had actually been the case, I would not be here discussing what happened next with all of you. And in fact, what did happen next was that in October, um, Biogen came out and announced to the surprise of many that it had conducted some subsequent analyses with a slightly larger data set. It had looked at some subgroups and determined with, you know, FDA in consultation with the FDA that they were going to pursue regulatory approval of aducanumab. And in fact, that's what they did. So in August, FDA said that they had accepted the biologics application and they were going to put it forward for priority review. So as the progress unfolds in November of 2020, the FDA's Peripheral and Central Nervous System Advisory Committee meets, and that is a group of external experts who advise the FDA. So their recommendations to the FDA are not binding. However, they are considered highly influential at this time. So at that particular meeting, the FDA's um, the director of their Office of Neuroscience, Billy Dunn, comes out and he strongly supports the aducanumab application. Now, one of the things people later commented on is that he had sort of been dismissive of an FDA statistician's concerns about the drug, that he had um, seemed just highly enthusiastic. In fact, he had answered questions that had been directed to the Biogen executives. And some people later described his behavior as being a cheerleader for the company. So people felt that this was concerning behavior. It was certainly unusual for a regulator who's thought to be in a more neutral position of trying to determine which drugs are safe and effective. So at this point in time, the advisory committee took a vote and the members with one abstention voted unanimously that they, you know, that the FDA should not approve aducanumab. And they cited both that there had been um, no proven effectiveness on the primary outcome, which was that reduction in the CDRSB score, right? So there was no proven effect for patients. And at the same time, there was compelling evidence um, that there are risks associated with what's known as amyloid-related imaging abnormalities or the brain bleeding and swelling that I talked about previously. So they voted against it. And one thing that they specifically did not do at this meeting was consider the appropriateness of the accelerated approval pathway for aducanumab. And this is because Dunn had told them that they would not be considering that um, because they, you know, Right, which then the, I should specify here that the surrogate endpoint that would be used here would be clearance of amyloid plaques. And that this was a controversial surrogate endpoint never used by the agency, and so they wouldn't be considering it. So the FDA specifically disclaimed they would be considering it. And the accelerated approval pathway, it's worth saying, allows for early approval of drugs that are you know, used to treat serious conditions and that fill an unmet medical need based on a surrogate endpoint. So this is, we can think of it conceptually as linked to activists from, um, you know, in the HIV AIDS era who were trying to make sure that drugs were available sooner to people who were dying of the disease. And I would say that this pathway has always had a somewhat uneasy tension at its center. And that's the tension between speeding drugs to patients who really are in need of them, right? They have they are desperate for some sort of disease modifying therapy. And at the same time, because you're hastening it, you have less certainty about safety and efficacy. And so this is a pathway that many people feel is important. Patients tend to be in favor of it, but 
there's attention at its center that we have to keep in mind. So FDA says here, we're not considering it. The advisory board doesn't consider it either as a result. And so there was a lot of surprise in June 2021 when FDA came out and announced that it had granted accelerated approval to aducanumab. So here is the press release that was issued by the FDA. And what we see here is that they're laying out the case for why accelerated approval was important. So they talk about how there are no currently available disease modifying therapies, that this will be the first therapy to target and affect the underlying disease process of Alzheimer's disease. So they're going back to the biomarkers and saying what, you know, this, this clears amyloid. And so we think that we have the surrogate endpoint that we're going to use. And we are going to get this drug out to patients faster who really want it. So immediately we had controversy ensue and with FDA announcing this, one of the things they talked about was the price. Well, Biogen talked about the price and that was coming out at $56,000 a year. Now, various people weighed in on the appropriateness of this price. I think the voice that I most valued in all of this was the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review. And this is a group that does cost effectiveness analysis. And what they said is that based on their reading of the data, that a fair annual price would be between $2,500 and $8,300. Now they had done another model where they were slightly more optimistic about the data that Biogen had provided and said that even if they had their most favorable reading of the data, that they felt like the maximum reasonable price would be $23,000. So well short of the $56,000 a year that Biogen had proposed. Now, when we think about a drug that's that expensive and we think about how many people would potentially be candidates, right? Dementia affects about 6 million Americans. They estimated that Biogen would stand to receive in excess of $50 billion per year for aducanumab. And the last line of this excerpt from their press release is, I think, incredibly important. They note that this is while waiting for evidence to confirm that patients receive actual benefits from treatment. So that's the idea of the accelerated approval pathway, is that you speed the drug to market, but then you still need to get confirmatory evidence after it's on the market. So here we are paying a huge amount of money for a drug that we don't know for sure works. And there are obviously consequences for that as the cost is borne not only by insurers, not only by patients who are paying out of pocket for co-payments and deductibles, but also by everyone else who's in the insurance pool. So that's the timeline that all of us were living in, right? We were living in this timeline where we see the engage and the eMERGE trials end. Then we see Biogen come back and say, you know what, we're actually going to apply for approval. And then we see the accelerated approval even after FDA disclaims that they're going to consider that pathway. So let's go back and see the timeline that Biogen and FDA were living while we were all living in that first timeline. So the first thing we know is that Biogen and FDA actually started having private meetings in the spring of 2019. So after Engage and Emerge had ended, um, various executives from FDA started putting together a plan to try to revive the drug. And here I want to point people to Stat Plus. They've done a phenomenal job reporting all of this. A lot of what we know about what happened is through their reporting. And what they talk about is what was known internally to Biogen as Project Onyx. And the idea was to revive um, aducanumab for approval by FDA. And a key part of that plan was enlisting the support of Billy Dunn, right? So we've already heard about him. He was the cheerleader that stood out from FDA at the November advisory committee meeting. So these meetings that are happening are really considered to be contrary to FDA protocol. And again, raise serious concerns about conflict of interest. The next thing we see is that by June of that year, FDA actually came forward with the idea for accelerated approval. So months before they said they weren't thinking about it at that advisory committee meeting, they came out and said that in fact, they thought that Biogen should consider the accelerated approval pathway. So at the time that move was surprising even to Biogen executives because of course, when they finished the Engage and Emerge trials early for that futility analysis, they were not thinking they had met their clinical endpoint of slowing cognitive and functional decline. 
typically when we think about the accelerated approval pathway, you are using the surrogate endpoint because you cannot test a clinical endpoint. You are not using the surrogate endpoint because you have tested and failed to meet the clinical endpoint. And additionally, the FDA had never used the pathway for Alzheimer's disease. Typically it's used for cancer. That's where we've seen most of it. Um, and additionally, the amyloid hypothesis um, this idea that if we clear amyloid, we can actually slow or prevent the onset of dementia has been the subject of tremendous controversy within the field of Alzheimer's disease research, given that multiple drugs have failed on this basis. Um, the thought was that this was maybe not the best hypothesis to double down on. So lots of reasons why there was suspicion. Another thing that happens while we're going through this period, right, so we've now had Biogen working with FDA, trying to figure out a path forward. And we know that after the advisory committee meeting, the Alzheimer's Association reached out to the FDA and they said that they would be interested in having an additional listening session with FDA representatives because they did not feel that the patient voice had adequately been heard in the November advisory committee meeting. And so what happened is the Alzheimer's Association actually arranged for a meeting with FDA and that included six patients, six patients, and two caregivers who talked about their lived experience with Alzheimer's disease, as well as how they would feel about having access to a drug. And what we know from this period of time is quite limited. There's been no record of who attended the meeting. There are no transcripts. A colleague of mine actually reached out to the FDA and asked if there was any information. FDA wrote back and said there wasn't because in listening sessions like this, patients share private information that's not appropriate for the public domain and that no information would be forthcoming. So we really don't know a lot about what happened here other than that this was this small group of people that had an audience with FDA and was able to talk about their willingness to take an unproven drug. So I think that gets us all the way through our timeline up to the point of approval, right? And we now have a sense of everything that was happening or at least some of the key events that were there. And I wanna talk about what happened in the aftermath of the approval. So one of the first things we see is that three members of the advisory committee resigned in protest. So here is the letter, the resignation letter that was posted by Dr. Aaron Kesselheim. He's part of the portal program at Harvard Medical School and, Mass and Brigham and Women's Hospital. He has training in law, medicine, and ethics. And what he wrote in his letter was that he thought this was probably the worst drug approval decision in recent US history. And he said that while it had been his great honor to serve on the advisory committee, that he was stepping back until he felt that FDA could more act, you know, adequately handle the advisory committee advice. Another thing we saw is that there was a huge divide within the field, the medical field, I would say, about whether or not aducanumab should have been approved. But one area where there was consensus, right? If we saw a partisan divide on approval, we saw consensus on the fact that people felt like the original label was much too broad. So the original label actually just said that adjuhelm is an amyloid beta directed antibody indicated for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, period. That's it. And people felt, right, on clinicians on both sides felt that it was important that they actually specify that the treatment was appropriate for people who looked like the individuals who've enrolled in the clinical trial. So the highlighted language here is the language that was added to the label saying that Agihelm should be initiated to patients with mild cognitive impairment or mild dementia stage of disease because that was the clinical trials population. Now, of course, you know, FDA does not regulate the practice of medicine and an FDA approved drug can be offered to patients off label. This doesn't preclude that possibility, but at least it has a narrowing function of saying this is where we have data and you need to make decisions otherwise. And I'm going to talk more about off label use or prescribing a drug for an indication or to a population or via a route not on the FDA approved label in subsequent slides. So I'll flag that now. Two other shortcomings of the label that I think are worth highlighting. One is that it doesn't mention the need for any sort of amyloid testing, which is surprising since this is an anti-amyloid therapy. And it also doesn't mention APOE testing. So APOE is a gene that speaks to an individual's risk of late onset Alzheimer's disease. It's just a susceptibility gene. It only speaks to part of their risk. And what was seen in the Engage and Emerge trials was that the link 
um, that one's APOE genotype was actually linked to one's risk of brain bleeding and swelling. And so there have been individuals who suggest that we need to actually stratify patients based on their APOE genotype as, you know, to understand their risk, possibly dosing, and to think about treatment in the context of the patient's genetic profile. And that's, that APOE testing is not mentioned on the label either. Okay, and then I have a general bucket now that's not on the timeline specifically because there was just a lot of controversy that was happening around here, a lot of discussion. I don't think I've ever seen a drug that is so actively discussed in mainstream media um, as Agihelm was. So, you know, I, I think appropriately individuals from FDA, including Billy Dunn, who was the first author on this manuscript that I have here, came out in defense of the approval decision. So this is um, a viewpoint that was published in JAMA Internal Medicine. And one of the parts that was in that piece is he says, in listening sessions, we heard from patients and their families. Now I recall that was six patients and two caregivers in that January listening session that I was talking about. And they talked about the devastating toll the disease had taken and their desire for treatment to stop or delay functional, license, um, functional losses. Many made it clear that they are willing to accept the trade-off of some uncertainty about clinical benefit in exchange for earlier access to a potentially effective drug. So this gets us right back to that trade-off at the heart of accelerated approval and you know, the, the wrestling that needs to happen with when we have the right balance between speed and certainty. Now with my colleagues, Andrew Peterson and Holly Fernandez Lynch, we sort of weighed in on the other side saying that it was really not appropriate that FDA had depicted people who were anti um, aducanumab as being anti-patient, which is really how I think that article read to many in the field. And what we pointed out is that unfortunately, patient desperation in the face of crushing realities like a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment or dementia, that has no bearing on a drug's effectiveness against disease. And wanting to, a drug to work really is not going to make it so. So sometimes FDA has to be in the difficult position of making decisions that are at odds with the wishes of some patients. We go on in this article to outline five considerations or times when we think that patient input can be particularly useful in the drug approval process because we're trying to navigate right between excessive paternalism and keeping patients excluded from approval decisions, but also not excessive deference to what patients want, given that while they're experts in their values and their interests, the FDA is expert in the underlying science. So the first of our recommendations is that patient input is most valuable in close cases where um, available data and regulatory frameworks do not clearly indicate whether a drug should be approved or not. And Agihelm was not a case like this because again, it had failed to meet the clinical endpoint. And so this was not meant to rescue, right? Desperation should not rescue a drug that has failed in that way. Second, FDA needs to take into account the diversity of patient opinion and avoid generalizations about patient preferences. Um, obviously, sometimes this requires just talking to a lot of people, which we know that FDA didn't do in this case. I think it also involves seeking out patients who are affiliated with more than one, say, patient advocacy group. Um, I know just from talking with the social workers who interact with patients and caregivers routinely at the Memory Center at the University of Pennsylvania, that you know there are some caregivers who are very excited about the possibility of aducanumab, and there were some caregivers who were actually incredibly resentful that if we were willing to spend, say, $50 billion a year on aducanumab, we really should be investing many more resources for patients who couldn't take aducanumab to support caregiving and dementia-friendly um, care in societies. Third, and this is closely related to number two, um, but FDA has obligations to current and future patients, and so the desperation of today's patients who want things sped up should not outweigh the interests of future patients in having certainty and high-quality evidence. Fourth, communication between the FDA, patients, families, caregivers, and advocacy groups really needs to be bi-directional. So it's important not just that the FDA listen, the FDA also needs to educate. So when we talk about the central trade-off in accelerated approval, when we think about the trade-off between speed and certainty, patients need to understand, right? This is approval where we won't have evidence for years. Um, in the case of aducanumab, they were initially given by the FDA nearly a decade to get confirmatory evidence. And once we have approval like that, that can have ramifications, say, for participation and research. If patients opt out 
of research because they're interested in purchase, you know, just getting a drug that can be prescribed to them. It can certainly have cost implications, you know, lots of things that FDA needs to potentially communicate. And the fifth consideration is that FDA really needs to resist a something is better than nothing mindset. So that mindset, I think, is completely understandable when it comes to an individual patient and caregiver who might make the decision that they would like to have access to aducanumab. But the FDA is not making decisions for individual patients. That's why we have things like the expanded access pathways that gives patients a chance to access drugs that are not yet approved um, you know, while clinical trials are going forward. But when FDA approves a drug using accelerated approval, they're making a decision for everybody. And they are making a decision that limits the quality and quantity of evidence that's available to all prescribing clinicians and to all patients. And so it's important to realize that they have a, an essential gatekeeping role and that to the point I made previously, right, that sometimes you have to say no to patients. They need to resist just approving anything that comes to them. So, you know, it does require sometimes saying no. So this point about FDA gatekeeping and how FDA abdicated that responsibility, I think, in aducanumab actually gets us to more general points about gatekeeping. So once FDA doesn't control the flow, other people have to pick up those responsibilities. And in fact, we saw quite a lot of that after the approval of aducanumab. So initially, we saw some health systems saying that they were going to not provide aducanumab. So, you know, here are a few really prominent ones. So Cleveland Clinic, Mount Sinai. The Department of Veterans Affairs said that they wouldn't be providing aducanumab to veterans who they were caring for. In surveys, major insurers have indicated that they won't pay for aducanumab until there's some greater proof that the drug works. And then looking internationally, right, not just to domestic gatekeepers like health systems and payers, but we've seen that other drug approval agencies have declined to approve aducanumab. So EU regulators have said no, as have Japanese administrators. So, you know, the drug has really not fared nearly as well as we might have guessed in those early moments after approval, you know, again, based on that history that we had set the goal of having a disease modifying therapy. So in light of this public pushback, we saw a few things happening with Biogen. We saw first off that they had been given um, nearly a decade, nine years by FDA to complete their confirmatory trials. And many people had been complaining in the press about why that was really just not fast enough. Again, it's this idea that I mentioned where you know, that's a huge period of time where we we're paying for a very expensive drug and we're not sure that we're accruing any benefit for it. And so, you know, while they had this long timeline, Biogen ultimately came out and said that they were going to try to get the initial data available within four years to make things faster. I also planted the seeds several slides ago that we were going to have cost issues coming back. And in fact, you know, ICER estimated that it would be $50 billion a year if we had the sort of low end estimate of eligible patients taking aducanumab. And in fact, CMS came out and said that they were going to have to raise Medicare Part B premiums in 2022. And they cited the inclusion of ag um, aducanumab as one of the main reasons for the increase. So of course, seeing those premiums go up, pretty significantly led to another round of outcry about the expense associated with the drug. And not long after, right, we have now people who are declining to provide it. We have Medicare saying that they need to have, you know, premiums go up. And what we see is that, you know, aducanumab is just not doing very well. In the third quarter, they reported sales of only, uh, only $300,000. So not many people are, um, either wanting or receiving this drug. And Biogen ended up announcing that they would have a new price of $28,200 that they would charge. Now, notably, this is still well in excess of what ICER had indicated was its estimate of what the drug should actually you know, be charging. Um, and even at their upper end estimate, we still see this is about $5,000 more than what the recommended price from ICER was. So 
The next thing we have is we come to January of this year and we see that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, proposed there would be coverage without evidence development for aducanumab. So what that means is that the drug will be provided to individuals who are participating in Medicare plans. However, in order to get the drug, they will have to participate in research. Now, coverage without evidence development is not new. There have been sort of robust ethical defenses put out by ethicists and policymakers of why it's appropriate if we have a drug or a device that we don't know if it works, why individuals might have access to it because it's promising, but we need to get more information. Oftentimes, this is data that's collected through registry studies. Um, and so we see this is now suggested for aducanumab. Um, they are, you know, it's, it's still early days. The comment period just closed a week or two ago for this proposal. We don't know yet how it's going to look. Um, people have certainly recommended that we have randomized trials. There has been recommendations that we should consider novel designs like step wedge trials or different pragmatic trials. Um, obviously, there are questions here about how that trial works. You know, how do we randomize someone to a placebo if they're paying a co-payment on a drug? How do we think about that? I think all of those details can be worked out eventually. Um, so I'll just put a pin in them and we can set them to the side. I think what is noteworthy about the announcement that there would be coverage with evidence development is that the Alzheimer's Association came out incredibly strongly against this. So they issued this statement, this is their tweet, um, that they felt like the CMS decision, the draft decision was a shocking instance of discrimination against people with Alzheimer's disease. And they specifically highlight the health disparities that we know exist in Alzheimer's disease treatment and care. So unfortunately, it's the case that um, Black and Hispanic older adults bear a disproportionate burden of Alzheimer's disease in the United States. And we know that additionally, those individuals in you know, are also less likely to have a diagnosis that's a timely diagnosis, more delays in seeking care, receiving appropriate care. So this is a huge area of disparities. Um, I will candidly say that I think that it was a little disingenuous for the Alzheimer's Association to bring it up in this context. And that's for reasons that I think were quite well laid out by Jennifer Manley and Maria Glymore in this piece that predates the CMS announcement, but talks more generally about the problems with Alzheimer's disease research and care. So while we know that we have a higher rate, you know, higher prevalence of Alzheimer's disease amongst Black and Hispanic older adults, it's also the case that they were really underrepresented in the Biogen Engage and Emerge trials. So Biogen reported that only six Black people were randomized to the treatment dose that was approved by the FDA. So this is a population that was it's persistently not just in the Biogen trials, but it's persistently underrepresented in Alzheimer's disease research. You know, the approval is now based on very limited evidence of safety and efficacy for this particular patient population. And, you know, these have been issues for a long time. And so at the very, you know, and, and after approval, and it was an expensive drug, there were concerns that there would be um, injustices and in who could pay for a drug like that, who could bear the out-of-pocket costs, for example, um, get access to the kinds of centers that are potentially offering a drug like this that has monthly infusions where you would need to be seen in a facility and to only bring up the disparities issue at the time of the CMS coverage of evidence development proposal for many people felt like um, sort of trying to pirate language that's been used appropriately and passionately by many advocates in the field for more representative research and improved care um, to try to argue against evidence development for a drug that we have you know, uncertainty that it works and a clear risk profile people felt was quite inappropriate. So I'm gonna take a deep breath because I think what we've just done is quickly rocket through a few years of research and regulatory science to get ourselves to the present. And what I'm going to do is pivot and look to some challenges that I think are ahead. Now, some of these challenges would exist independent of aducanumab, but I think aducanumab has introduced some new ones and they've accelerated other problems. And so it's time that we think in a forward looking fashion about all of this. And first I'll start by talking about direct to consumer marketing of aducanumab. So shortly after aducanumab was approved and you know we see that headline, I started with the New York Times headline where patients have hope but clinicians are left wondering. We saw that there was a direct to consumer marketing campaign that had this 
huge story laid out in the New York Times. Now, of course, we can see that it does have the Biogen logo up here in the upper left-hand corner. We see that it has the paid post banner. But when you scroll through the article, it's quite easy to forget that this is actually a paid advertorial and not, in fact, an article that's been written by you know, the reporters who are at the New York Times. So this particular piece, When Memory Fades, talks about a couple, um, Jane and Jim. They've been married for 50 years. Right around the time of their anniversary party, they had a huge party. Jane was not able to recognize all of the friends who came to celebrate their anniversary with them. She was ultimately diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. And the couple has sought out a variety of brain health strategies um, and they talk about all of this. They also talk about the need to move past the stigma of Alzheimer's disease and talk to your doctor about what the possibilities are for you. Now, the article has also been criticized for having some misinformation about the sort of frequency with which MCI occurs in the population. I'll leave that to the side. Um, what is interesting is when you scroll to the bottom of the advertorial, you do get this message. It says, don't ignore changes related to memory loss, thinking, or behavior. See a doctor at the first sign of symptoms. And they have a link to this website called It's Time You Know. So if we come to the It's Time You Know website, here is the home screen of that, um, right? We come right back to the issue of health disparities and we see that they have selected a picture of an African-American woman to lead their page. Now, if you click around on this website, there are various things. One thing they offer is actually a quiz that you can take where you talk about various symptoms. Now, when this website first went up, um, this is an editorial that was published in STAT and the neurologist who wrote it talked about how he took the quiz twice and one time he answered all the questions which ask about things like how often do you forget important appointments, how often do you lose track of a conversation that you're part of, and one time he indicated that it was often, and when he got to the end of that survey he was told that cognitive screening may be right for him. Well, he took it again and said that he never forgot things, never lost the thread of a conversation. And here again, we see that while the language is slightly different, it still, the survey still directs him to talk to his doctor about concerns he might have and to ask his doctor if cognitive screening is right for him. So much like we saw the response, you know, the, the initial FDA label, we see the response leading to a revision of the label. There have been revisions to this website. I went back for everybody's benefit and took the quiz this morning saying that I never had trouble forgetting things or losing my train of thought. And in fact, they have changed the text. And now it says that it's never too early to stay on top of my cognitive health. But instead of recommending screening, they recommend various brain health behaviors like exercising, um, improving my diet, nutrition, and also engaging in brain games. So we have seen some changes here, but this is one of these ethical issues with direct-to-consumer advertising. On the one hand, companies want to say it's their First Amendment right, that FDA should regulate their advertising, but we might worry that when patients read things like this, it's both hard to discern the source of the information, because while it's not hidden that it's Biogen, it's also not clearly an advertisement, right? It's sent up more as information seeking. And you know, they are likely to come in and need to have clinicians talk with them about this information. A few other things to highlight as you tool around the website is that there is this education piece, right? Where they ask you, they talk about the symptoms of MCI and dementia. And they also allow you to enter your zip code and you can find locations for clinicians who will offer presumably aducanumab because when I type in the address in which I would expect to find the Penn Memory Center, right? Which is where I do a lot of my research and training have many friends and colleagues who work there. Um, that's not listed at all. In fact, we see that there's a nice empty spot on the graph. There's no pin for the Penn Memory Center. So there's been some thought that these are clinicians who have been selected because of you know, possibly being more amenable to um, prescribing aducanumab. So patients are likely to come in. They're likely to talk to their clinicians, potentially their pharmacists about needing cognitive testing, wanting screening, and getting aducanumab. So the next thing I will talk about is bringing Alzheimer's disease into the 21st Century Cures Act. So the 21st Century Cures Act is a law that had a number of provisions, and one of these was that you actually, um, for places that have electronic medical records, they need to make sure that laboratory and imaging results, clinical notes are easily, immediately, and electronically accessible to patients. So the idea behind the 21st Century Cures Act really was to try to 
make sure that individuals, you know, we, we kind of avoided paternalism and physicians being overly controlling of information and empowered patients by giving them immediate access to information about themselves and their health. Now, many people came out in the aftermath of that and said that it really was an overly blunt tool, that there was you know, no discrimination between different kinds of medical information. And certainly, you know, people felt like in some cases, sure, maybe it's okay if your hemoglobin A1C is released quickly, but how do we think about things like a cancer diagnosis if a patient were to log in and see a, say, a mammogram result before the team reached out to them to let them know that they had um, you know, a suspicious finding on a mammogram. So with my colleague, Angela Bradbury, we talked a bit about bringing Alzheimer's disease into this. And I think there are two important reasons why we need to think about this. We have this window right now where not a lot of testing is happening for Alzheimer's disease, but I think we're going to see both an increase in amyloid PET scans and CSF um, testing for amyloid if a drug like aducanumab or similar is routinely available because patients will likely need to be screened to make sure they're a good candidate for it and those results will be released. Additionally, we might expect that there is um, APOE testing to see again about the risk of ARIA that people might have based on their APOE genotype. And these are two kinds of information that have been um, really not disclosed clinically. So most clinicians don't have the ability to do it or you know, practice doing it, I should say, not, a, not an inability, but a lack of practice doing this sort of thing. Um, and there have been a lot of concerns historically, debates within the field of Alzheimer's disease research and care about the appropriateness of releasing this information because it's not seen generally as being medically actionable. Um, and also there have been concerns that it's not actually safe to release the information, although I have been part and others have been part of conducting studies that show that most people who receive this information don't report any kind of clinically significant levels of anxiety or depression after they get information like this. Now this doesn't, that shouldn't obscure the fact that they have sort of this rich emotional experience in response to the information. I'll talk a bit about that in several more slides, um, but it is safe generally to disclose. So things we talk about here is that, you know, I had a colleague who I think very appropriately joked that when we talk about amyloid and tau, you know, the old expression, it's Greek to me, it is literally Greek to patients when we talk about amyloid and tau. And so it's important that we provide this kind of information. So when patients log in, it makes sense to them. So there needs to be a lay summary. We also recommend that it would be useful to develop some sort of self-directed educational materials, um, hopefully with input from professional societies, the National Institute on Aging and others where patients can actually go and learn more about amyloid results, APOE results um, in a self-guided way with references that are available and appropriately tailored to patients. And the idea behind this is if the 21st Century Cures Act was really meant to empower patients, the mere fact of disclosing information to individuals is not itself empowering. If I don't understand the information or if I don't understand how to use the information to make choices that are guided by my values and preferences, I'm not any better off. And so it's really important that we take advantage of this window before we have really a lot of amyloid testing and disclosure, a lot of tau scans and disclosure, a lot of APOE testing and disclosure to get ahead of this and make sure that we're educating our patients in ways that are useful to them and also to their family members who in some cases are affected by this information, either because they share a risk with the individual, say they have a shared genotype or because they have a shared risk of now becoming a caregiver for somebody who's living with cognitive impairment. The next thing I'll touch on is the advent of blood-based biomarker testing. So for a long time, we have had, as I mentioned at the outset, a reliance on PET scans, MRI, if we're testing neurodegeneration, and also CSF. CSF is not very popular in the US. There are other countries where that's actually the primary method um, versus PET scan. Now, obviously those modalities are, for the most part, they can be expensive, they can be invasive, um, you can often need access to specialty facilities to get them. And so there's been a great interest in the field of moving toward blood-based biomarkers with the idea being that with a simple blood draw, you can test and see if a patient has amyloid or tau. Um, there's been tremendously promising research about this. And I think it won't be too long before we see it come out in practice. And of course, that will have great benefits in the US because it will be less invasive. It will be much cheaper. There's widespread infrastructure and research and care for blood draws. 
and it should improve access. In fact, people imagine that that will become a population level screening tool and that it might move testing into the primary care setting. Um, it also has benefits internationally because there are healthcare settings where it's much harder to get access to things like PET scans or MRIs. And yet we know that blood tests are common in those settings as well. So there's a potential that we could have more global equity with the availability of blood-based biomarkers. Now, of course, having these tests is going to raise challenges. You know, I already talked a bit about the 21st Century Cures Act and how that creates um, the need to figure out how to communicate this information. But if blood-based biomarkers really bring biomarker testing into the primary care space, that's a group of individuals who we already know oftentimes say that they don't feel that they have time or training to do full cognitive assessments to provide memory care. So they're going to need to learn how to do that testing. They're going to gain comfort with it. They will need to learn how to discuss the results with patients. Um, and they will also need to then think about whether treatment can be done appropriately at the primary care setting, which many patients would prefer, or if there needs to be a referral to advanced or specialty memory care. Now there are already huge waits for appointments at specialized memory centers. Um, there, you know, I think well, we want everybody to go ahead and have um, access to specialized care or the high quality care that they need. It's, you know, we need to think about health system burdens as well and, you know, what it will do if more and more people are screened and potentially looking for access to therapies. The other thing that we can think about with blood-based biomarkers is that for a long time in bioethics and you know, clinical settings, there have been concerns about 23andMe and the availability of direct-to-consumer genetic testing. So the field has already had to wrestle with what it means that 23andMe is allowing people to access their APOE results which again speak to that um, susceptibility to late onset Alzheimer's disease. But if we have blood-based biomarker testing, I'm going to suggest that we have to think about um, blood-based biomarkers in me or some equivalent direct-to-consumer biomarker testing. And that's because there are already existing direct-to-consumer lab services where you can either order a lab kind of bypassing a standard clinical office visit and have an online provider order that for you. And then you can take the lab slip to a lab, or in some cases, they will even send a phlebotomist to your home to draw the sample. Um, and so once these tests are available, there are already regulatory structures and business structures in place where people will be able to have blood-based biomarker testing. Now that could be a good means of improving access for patients who feel like this is stigmatized information and would prefer to test much like with say pregnancy testing or home HIV testing in their own home setting. Um, but again, it creates questions about patient education and making sure that we're ready. I would also say it raises questions about things like the adequacy of HIPAA because we know that various privacy protections like those afforded by HIPAA um, don't apply to businesses like 23andMe. This information is sometimes being packaged and sold by companies, say drug developers. And so privacy is going to be a huge issue here as we move forward. So next I wanna talk a bit about preclinical Alzheimer's disease and the changing patient experience. So I mentioned that we're moving from a syndromal definition to a biological definition of Alzheimer's disease. And we have biomarkers, amyloid, tau, and neurodegeneration that we can use to identify individuals who are um, who have Alzheimer's disease pathology, but it turns out that this pathology can actually be identified in individuals years or even decades before the onset of cognitive impairment. And so now we can think about an individual's Alzheimer's disease pathology as a separate sort of spectrum from their syndromal cognitive stage. And what that gives us is that for individuals who have Alzheimer's disease biomarkers, in the absence of cognitive impairment, we have what we would think of as preclinical Alzheimer's disease, All right? So no symptoms, but pathology. So currently that's a research construct and they're not currently disclosing Alzheimer's, preclinical Alzheimer's disease diagnoses to patients. Um, and yet when we go back to the It's Time website by Biogen, um, we see that they do talk about preclinical Alzheimer's disease. And I think this is setting things up for off-label prescribing. So again, when, when we think about you know, the ability to, um, you know, FDA is not regulating the practice of medicine, that this is setting it up to get at least some patients interested in treating the pathology in the absence of cognitive impairment. Now, if the preclinical construct is validated and we find a disease modifying therapy that people can really get behind, I think that we can expect 
you know, gene and biomarker testing become the standard of care. And for these individuals who learn their risk of dementia before the onset of cognitive impairment, it really is going to change their lived experience. So this is an area where I've been conducting research for a number of years. I would highlight a few things about this experience. First, we know that biomarker results are seen as different than other medical test results. So a patient who learns they have amyloid sees implications for their identity, right? This is their brain, their mind involved. And so they see that as threatening them and their integrity in a unique way. They immediately highlight relationships with others and the potential for stigma and discrimination. They talk about how losing your mental faculties is seen as different by other people than, say, losing your eyesight or your hearing. They point to the uncertainty of the outcome. Just because you have preclinical Alzheimer's disease doesn't mean that you will develop mild cognitive impairment or dementia. In fact, a majority of people who have preclinical Alzheimer's disease will likely die of another cause um, before they have the onset of dementia. And finally, there's this lack of medical actionability. Now, I will caution that we conducted this particular qualitative study before aducanumab had been approved. And so there are, I think, questions about who would be interested in taking this drug off-label. But people routinely pointed out to us that, you know, if you have diabetes, you take insulin. If you have heart disease, you stop smoking. But there's less that you can do for preclinical Alzheimer's disease. Sadly, I think that their concerns about stigma and discrimination are merited. This, these are results from a survey, a nationally representative survey conducted by my colleague, Dr. Shana Stites. And what she found is that a positive biomarker result caused greater worries about discrimination, harsher judgments of symptoms. These are clinically, you know, cognitively unimpaired as described in the vignette in the survey. Um, so, but people were still harsher judgment of symptoms, more antipathy, more pity and greater social distance just by virtue of having a biomarker. Learning these results can also, I would say, affect family members who get this information. So when we have interviewed family members who learn a loved one's um, result of an amyloid PET scan, they talk about emotional reactions. So I'll focus here on individuals who have elevated amyloid. When they talk about sadness, if the individual has that, they share that similar emotional reaction. They often talk about interpreting their memory a bit more harshly and they start monitoring it. So we have individuals who talk about how they're watching mom more closely. I think that's a potential area for friction in families because understandably older adults do not necessarily want to have um, their children or their spouse watching them more closely. And family members also, and we see this also in MCI and dementia, but they change their health behaviors. They improve their own health in an effort both to protect their brains and also to be a physically healthy caregiver. And they start to change their future plans in anticipation of cognitive decline. So they might move things up. And I would say that it's this, this information for people, you know, even when it's not medically actionable, they often describe it as empowering information because it can enable um, changes in future plans. And then the final issue I want to talk about is FDA's open door. So aducanumab's approval, as I've emphasized, has, was really the first of its kind, right? The FDA had not used um, the accelerated approval pathway for Alzheimer's disease before. They had not used aducanumab as, or uh, they had not used amyloid as a surrogate endpoint before this point. But when they did that, they really did throw open the door to the accelerated approval pathway to other drugs. We've already seen other companies with other drugs coming forward. Um, Denenumab and Lacanumab are two that have already indicated they're going to try to get to market. And so people are worried, I think appropriately so, that by signaling they were okay with approving aducanumab, that FDA will not only get more drugs that are perhaps of similar similarly concerning efficacy and benefit, you know, risk benefit profiles. But they've probably also slowed the field down in finding other therapies because this has led to a doubling down on the amyloid hypothesis. So instead of going and trying to figure out what we can do maybe about tau, we're thinking about other modalities. People are going to continue investing in the amyloid hypothesis, which many people, even before aducanumab, felt more than ready to give up. I would say too that in addition to thinking about patients with Alzheimer's disease, we see that there are other patient groups that are clamoring to have access to the accelerated approval pathway. Individuals with Alzheimer's disease or um, with ALS are a key example of this. And so while we see on the one hand patient groups pushing for greater and greater access to drugs that you know sooner, I think the FDA has to be incredibly careful navigating this period because at the same time that we have patients looking for more access. We see that there are efforts led by the Goldwater Institute and others to try to undermine FDA's authority, right? So the right to try act is a great example of this by trying to cut the FDA out of decisions 
about access to you know, drugs that are not yet approved. Um, and I think the FDA has to be careful not to effectively you know, right to try itself out of business. They need to be staunch defenders of the value that they bring to patients, to families, to society, and really take on that gatekeeping role in a strong way. So as I wrap up, I'll just say that FDA's approval decisions reflect normative judgments, right? So we think about them as informed by science and they are to some extent, we think about them as informed by regulatory frameworks and they are to some extent, but ultimately they have to make a decision. What's safe enough? What's effective enough? And a key challenge when we have normative decisions like that is that reasonable people can disagree about whether or not the right decision has been made, right? We can't definitively say oftentimes that a decision has been right or wrong. So especially in the context of accelerated approval, I would suggest that FDA needs to think about a standard of reasonableness, right? Not rightness, not wrongness, but reasonableness. And what we want is for the FDA to engage in various steps to help assure that even people who disagree ultimately with the decision they reach can recognize the decision making as legitimate. And I think when we look at things that would make things reasonable, appropriate stakeholder engagement, um, thinking about scientifically robust endpoints, thinking about um, you know, appropriate deference to non-political figures, statisticians, others who are close to data, the advisory committee, um, that really the adjective of decision fell short of reasonableness. And so, you know, I won't say, I probably tipped my hand, I won't say that I think it was right or wrong. I, I will say that I think that had we followed a reasonable process that a different decision would have ultimately been reached. And with that, I want to say thank you so much, and I look forward to answering questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Largent. That was fantastic. Um, a lot of uh, topics were covered there, and we have some really good questions here. Um, so we have about 12 or 13 minutes or so um, for questions, and I'll start with this one here. Um, how can blood biomarkers or other biomarkers account or adjust for the fact that individuals die in their 80s or 90s? who meet criteria for Alzheimer's disease upon autopsy, but never demonstrated the dementia syndrome in life? Um, what are the ethics of treating a disease which was never going to affect one's quality of life? Yeah, so this is certainly not unique to Alzheimer's disease. I think prostate cancer is a great example where we know that there are a lot of people who are perhaps treated, even treated aggressively, who you know, it would have been better to pursue watchful waiting. So I think there's always a tension and you know, the field is continuing to try to figure out what are the cognitive reserves, what are the factors that make people resilient so that we can both try to get more people on these pathways where they have the pathology, but don't have the symptoms. Um, and then also to make sure that we're treating an appropriate range of people. I mean, from my perspective, the risk benefit profile of aducanumab is such that if an individual doesn't have cognitive impairment, it would be really inappropriate to treat them with a drug that has uncertain benefit and you know, definite risks. And for a patient where we don't know for sure that they would ever develop Alzheimer's disease um, symptoms anyhow. Um, a question here from Jeffrey Clark. Without statistically significant results in the aducanumab trials, would you comment on how certain we are that we have identified a valid biomarker or surrogate endpoint? So questioning um, amyloid as a surrogate endpoint. Yeah, I think I share the skepticism here. Um, you know, we, we just don't know right now. And I think a lot of trials have made many people skeptical that there's a sufficient link between the amyloid clearance and the outcomes that patients really care about, right? When I talk with patients, I'm sure when many of you talk with patients, the things people care about is, you know, can they drive longer? Can they take care of their grandchildren longer? Is there less forgetfulness? Um, and, you know, we really don't, I think, have a good linkage between those clinical outcomes people really care about, the things that will make measurable differences in their quality of life and amyloid clearance. And I, I worry that we should, you know, perhaps cast the, uh, I'll leave it to the scientists, but not the lawyers but we should probably not cast, uh, we should think about getting rid of amyloid as our primary endpoint. Yeah. Um, a, a comment and question here about the role of counseling on non-farm interventions that show some promise. So things like nutrition, brain games, um, exercise, social interaction. Um, could you comment on how you think about those and some of the educational materials that you're developing? Yeah, so I love that question because when we have been at our center and as part of clinical trials that we have run, 
um, thought about disclosing amyloid, which we do to cognitively unimpaired individuals, as well as individuals with MCI and dementia, we wanted to make sure that when we left them, we didn't leave them feeling like they had nothing that they could do. So we often do talk about healthy lifestyle interventions. We promote exercise, um, nutrition, sleep, and cognitive engagement with others. Another thing we talk about a lot is pre-planning. So many people have told us that that's a valuable piece of the information. They can use the information to you know, update a living will or advanced directive. They sometimes update their actual wills. Maybe they sell property to move closer to an adult child who they anticipate would be their caregiver. And I think talking about the need for legal preparations as well as your physical health and well-being are great things that you can do in counseling so that people feel like they have options available to them. Um, without necessarily needing to have a pharmacologic intervention. Great. Um, at the end, you talked about the open door that the FDA has created. I was wondering if you could just expand that, on that a little bit and maybe um, do a little bit of prediction if, if you dare. Um, do you think that these two new drugs will, will follow that pathway and lead to the same result? Yeah, I think they'll be approved actually um, using the accelerated approval pathway. I think there will maybe be similar controversy. We'll see if they avoid some of the pitfalls and learn some lessons um, from aducanumab. So maybe the pricing will be a little bit different. One challenge that they're going to face now is that the CMS draft proposal to have coverage with evidence development was not limited to aducanumab. It was actually related to all am anti-amyloid therapies. And so they know they're coming into a landscape where there's already likely going to be some pushback on just prescribing it freely to individuals versus trying to limit and constrain access. I think we might see them start to challenge, um, you know, whatever the CMS decision ultimately is. I think there might be pushback on that by these companies that are coming after aducanumab as they try to differentiate themselves and seek broader market access. But it's, I, I think we'll see more approval and I do worry about the consequences that we're not going to see as many fruitful pathways being explored off to the side because there's going to be this focus on aducanumab and amyloid. Yeah, so along those lines, we have a question. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the 2021 published meta-analysis by Averginos and colleagues, where they pulled together all the phase three trials in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and they reported that monoclonal antibodies against A-beta induced clinical improvements of small effect sizes and biomarker improvements of large effect sizes. So the, the comment was whether or not you could comment on the um, adequacy of the conclusion, which is that it provides moderate support for the continuous development of anti-amyloid antibodies for, for Alzheimer's disease. And so kind of similar along these um, lines of the fruitfulness of, of pursuing this pathway. Yeah, I, I mean, this is a question that I really wish I could answer with more certainty, and I don't know that anybody can right now, which is that we do need to conduct trials like coverage with evidence development, see if those increase, you know, the the significant increase decreases in amyloid can also get us to clinically meaningful outcomes. I think my worry is that we're clearing amyloid and yet we don't know that that actually meaningfully slows you know, either the onset or the progression of cognitive impairment, which is what patients really care about. And this is an area where I would call for things like patient reported outcomes and thinking about better measurement techniques where we know if what we're getting is something we value rather than just the amyloid clearance. Um, a question about the direct-to-consumer marketing. So it seems like that needs to be met with kind of a counter direct-to-patient and direct-to-healthcare provider um, education. And I know you're working in this space um, about creating materials um, for people on, on a variety of topics, but I was wondering if you could just comment on what you see as is needed to kind of counter this messaging, because it, it seems ripe for confusion. Yeah, so we've had patients, you know, I, I don't, see patients in the memory center, but my colleagues who do have had some patients, some caregivers approach them to try to see if this would be appropriate for a family member. They've really wrestled with how to appropriately have a conversation. How do you talk about the fact that you don't feel supportive of an FDA approved drug that's the first of its kind for a devastating diagnosis? And family members really just want to see if there's a chance. Um, they have struggled with this. I know there are conversations about what to say. Oftentimes they end up discussing, you know, that they don't think the evidence is very compelling in terms of the likelihood of benefit. They talk about the risks, right? We know that there's a risk of ARIA. And then they sort of come to this place at the end where they say, you know, I will prescribe this to you if you really think this is the right thing to do, but I can't 
recommend it strongly on my own, right? Like if this was my parent, I wouldn't prescribe this to them. And I think that education process can be um, kind of slow, but we've actually seen that patients largely have been open to hearing those things and have not pushed for aducanumab after that. I mean, my colleague, Jason Carlowish, this was before the approval of aducanumab, but he actually put an op-ed in STAT where the, the headline was, um, you know, if FDA approves aducanumab, I won't prescribe it. So now he softened his stance a little bit and describes himself as a reluctant prescriber. Uh, I don't think he's actually written any prescriptions yet, but, you know, people, people are wrestling with, and I think there will continue to be conversations about how best to discuss this with patients. Well, seeing no other questions, I think we can uh, wrap up. So thank you again, Dr. Largent, for that uh, amazing presentation on a very hot and dynamic topic, um, and the, the story is not yet written. Um, so thank you all for joining us today um, at our Pline Center annual research lecture, and we look forward to seeing you at future Pline Center events. Thank you very much.